Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure. I think Carl for the invitation. Uh, great pleasure to give a presentation here. Of course, I was hoping it will actually enable me to travel to Morocco to have the meeting. I uh, visited Morocco a few years ago. Uh, what a beautiful place and uh, hopefully in the near future uh, we will actually meet in uh, three-dimensional <laughs> in person. So um, I think let me dive directly into my talk because the previous two speakers have given really nice introduction materials. So I would like to actually uh, zoom out and then let's uh, think a little bit about uh, uh, you know, what's the difference between lithium metal batteries compared to lithium ion and uh, what's the difference between liquid electrolyte versus solid electrolyte. So everybody knows this uh, uh, you know, energy band diagram, a uh, schematics of how intercalation chemistry works uh, and the typical voltage curve when we have the intercalation compound. Um, I want to emphasize here that uh, in the lithium ion batteries, when we use graphite, uh, lithium uh, nickel manganese oxide or lithium cobalt oxide, this is a very important thing is these both electrolyte, when you first assemble the battery, actually both electrodes are stable in the homo lumo level of the electrolyte. And when we start to sweep the voltage, um, this is where um, the uh, SEI gets formed and uh, we will see the stability, you know, like Andy mentioned, uh, all the coatings and things like that helps with the stabilization of the interface. So in the solid state battery, this is no longer true. Actually, in the lithium metal battery, this is not true because lithium metal, very few solvents, when you first immerse the lithium metal into the solvent, they are actually stable. So I think that's a very big distinction we have to realize. The second very important thing I would like to mention, why characterization tools are so important. Uh, because in the last decade, our entire field has developed many uh, advanced characterization tools. So actually, if you imagine the batteries, um, you know, the lifetime of the batteries, uh, we are treating it like a human body. Actually, all the advanced techniques you use for checking your dental, denti like x-ray for dentist and the MRI for your body, we use all those advanced tools for characterizing batteries and oftentimes operando. Why we have to do that is because thermodynamically speaking, the cell, the battery you have is a closed system. So how much energy carriers you have, like the lithium available lithium, that can be the lithium in the cathode, the lithium metal on the anode. Um, but no matter what is the total amount of lithium, if you have a system with very poor columbic efficiency, and when I say poor, it's actually above 90 something percent. Uh, actually the uh, uh, loss uh, of the um, active lithium can be really, really dramatic if you go from 99% to 99.9%. .9%. So that imposes a very big challenges for people who are working, like me, who are working on characterization. How can we uh, go from atomic level to primary particle level to then secondary particle? As we know, we need to pack in the fixed volume as much as materials as possible. Then to the electrode level, um, how can we actually detect every possible part of the degradation so that we can be quantitative as quantitative as possible. And in the early days when we have intercalation compounds, we have really you know the tools on diffraction based studies are very good for crystalline materials, right? So right now when we move towards um, solid state electrolyte, particularly the sulfide based materials, many of them are indeed glassy. They're not crystalline. Right, so that gives us new challenges. And last but not least, because we're moving towards solid state batteries, um, the electrolyte can no longer be evaporated during the processing. So we will be dealing, a very, dealing with the very big challenges. How can we characterize the solid solid interface? Um, so moving forward with my talk, I think uh, uh, everyone already understood why we have to do lithium metal batteries. Uh, if this very simple graph demonstrated the driving, uh, you know, the major driving force why we want to do lithium metal anode research, 
Um, actually, native metal anode is not a new concept. In 1976, when uh, Professor Whittingham published the first paper in Science Magazine, this is the architecture of the cell. Because at that time, there is no lithium cobalt oxide, no lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. The cathode contains no lithium. So you need a big block of thick lithium metal. And today, you know, so I'm skipping the part about the graphite and the carbon, uh, go directly to what we envision the future uh, lithium metal uh, battery look like. So you can already see the amount of lithium in the anode side is significantly reduced because in today's cathode, we have a lot of cathode materials contains large amount of lithium already. So in principle, you do not need that thick block of lithium metal. So this fundamental change in the cell architecture tell us that uh, the safety aspect of this lithium metal batteries may be very different. And secondly, we are actually looking at uh, really different types of electrolyte and looking at uh, the, the electrochemically deposits the lithium in these new safe electrolytes. So in order to study lithium, uh, Professor Yi Chui already presented to you all the challenges of looking at lithium because it's so unstable and it's so reactive with everything. So, um, you know, besides the transmission electron microscope uh, that we go for lower temperature, cryo temperature, I want to also show you even for simple SEM, when you want to look at the lithium metal, it's not that simple. Uh, in 2016, when we start doing the lithium metal research, when you use the focus iron beam that's made of gallium ions, you cut the interface of the lithium metal at room temperature, it is simply a mess, right? Because the gallium ions in your iron source are actually react with lithium. Remember, check the periodic table, lithium reacts almost to everything. Uh, and the gallium lithium has a phase diagram, gallium actually alloys with the lithium. So moving to the lower temperature, cryogenic temperature, significantly reduce the reactivity of the lithium metal and that's where you can actually see a very nicely preserved morphology. So this lithium was actually uh, vapor deposited. It should be like really dense without any pores. So almost all the phenomena we see with room temperature FIB SEM observation is basically artifacts. So in order to carefully study the uh, morphology introduced by the different electrolyte and the source for lithium metal, this kind of cryogenic cutting tools are very, very important because um, you can see in generation two electrolyte, when you do the electrochemically deposited lithium, you basically make these very highly torturous, porous uh, lithium metal uh, structure. They are still called a lithium metal. And if you actually um, do the XRD, they still look like crystal lithium, BCC lithium, but if you look at the microstructure of the lithium, they are completely different from the metals that we have imagined. Now, if we move to the new salts and the new electrolytes that have developed by Pacific Northwestern National Lab, one of our key members for the Battery 500, and the electrolytes we have received there really present a completely different microstructures, and you get this kind of very densely deposited lithium metal. And because of that, the columbic efficiency really increased very, very significantly and can enable us to cycle lithium metal for the long term, right? So why microstructure is so important? Um, you can actually draw very simple cartoon pictures. If you have very thin, long, and large torturous lithium grains, uh, this graph shows you the orange is the metallic lithium and the blue is what we call the uh, SEI, right? If you have this kind of microstructure, now depositing is not a problem, but when you stripping, when you, you know, start to discharge the battery, the lithium has to go back to the cathode, right? So if you have this kind of microstructure, and if there's any structural uh, disconnections, those orange parts, what we call the inactive lithium, they're still metal, but they are electrochemically inactive because they are detached from the electronic pathway. Now, if you have a very large granular lithium metal, then 
the probability of running to this kind of structural disconnections will be much less. And because the base, you know, for each of the lithium crystal, you have very big attachment with the current collector, you run into less problems of um, uh, uh, disconnection, right? So I think this is where um, the big differences we see in the different electrolyte on the top panel. Really what we see is that in the advanced electrolyte, we call the highly concentrated electrolyte uh, developed by PNNL, we are able to see really whatever left on the current collectors, majority of it is the uh, lithium oxide, the lithium fluoride, the lithium carbonate, SEI component. But on the contrary, in the conventional generation two carbonated electrolyte, we will see a large amount of um, metallic lithium. So imaging is, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, these kind of tools are qualitative. They're not quantitative. So how can I correlate this information to quantitative information? So uh, from chemistry, we know that uh, uh, titration and gas chromatography or uh, um, mass spectrometry can be highly quantitative. So it so happens that in uh, the electrochemically deposited lithium, only lithium metal will react with water to form hydrogen. And the other components, they are either dissolving in the water or they react with water to form other gas like uh, methane gas or carbon dioxide gas. So with that simple principle, we set up a, a very simple tool, but it's actually quite uh, sophisticated to do the calibration because you need to make sure the hydrogen amount is quantitative. So with that, uh, we actually measure the many, many different types of electrolytes. And every time when we actually plot the capacity loss with Columbic efficiency comparison and the amount of hydrogen we have measured, we see a perfect correlations. So what this experiment tell us is that uh, the, uh, when you have low efficiency electrolytes, particularly around you know, very low efficiency electrolyte, the metallic lithium dominates the capacity loss. It's actually not the SEI. Uh, we actually measure almost a similar SEI. So I'm not saying SEI is not important, but we need to first solve this um, dead lithium, in inactive lithium, metallic lithium problem first. So SEI is not the main reason for low columbic efficiency in lithium metal batteries. SEI is still important if you go above 99.6. So right now, many electrolytes are reaching the 99.6 efficiency. But if we want to go to 99.9, .9, what are the secret sources? So SEI is still really important, right? So um, the major achievement from the Battery 500 Consortium, I think Dr. Xiao Jie uh, presented a couple of weeks ago in ECS. I borrowed her slides. Uh, we were able today, you know, this is a real pouch cell, uh, two amp hour in size, and we actually was able to cycle uh, the cell, lithium metal cells uh, with quite um, uh, improved cycling ability. So um, le let me say why, how do we go to 99.9, .9, right? Because if we want a few thousand cycles, we still need the three nines in efficiencies. So, um, the only batteries I have tested that has uh, uh, lithium metal as the anode and can cycle thousands or ten thousands of cycles is actually the lithium lipon solid state batteries. So in order to study the lithium lipon interface, we have come out with a workflow uh, optimization for the solid state batteries. In fact, uh, from cutting of the solid state uh, thin batteries, to load it for the TEM study, the entire process is obtained at liquid nitrogen temperature. Because of that, we are able to very, very carefully preserve the interface microstructure and the nanostructure of the lithium metal and the lipon uh, solid state electrolyte. So lipon is actually uh, discovered in early 2000. Basically, it's already almost 20 years since its development. But nobody actually has carefully studied the interface between lithium metal and the lipon because of the lack of pro appropriate tools. So today, for the first time, we actually observed a 80 nanometer thick uh, uh, interface between the lithium and the lipon. 
but this interface is not as simple as we have imagined. Uh, it consists the mosaic structure of lithium oxide, lithium nitrate, and lithium phosphate. And uh, these kind of um, uh, mosaic uh, features are accompanied by many amorphous phases where we do not know exactly. They are still in the lithium side. You can see it's uh, in the some of the lithium uh, crystalline phase can be seen, but you can actually see quite a lot of the amorphous uh, regions. So this kind of uh, um, uh, interface has a very unique properties because we know we are, have no problem obtaining 99.9 .9 efficiencies and this kind of uh, uh, lithium lipon batteries you know uh, in the literature 10,000 cycles has been uh, obtained so I would say that we still have a quite long way to truly understand uh, uh, what is the interface stable interface for the lithium metal anode but the good news I would say I mean, in the thin film batteries with the lithium and the lipon interface is a good uh, model compound to understand. Uh, of course, in the thin film, I'm only moving five micron lithium at one time. But in the pouch cell I show you just now, we're moving 20 micron lithium uh, each time we're charging, discharging the battery. So that's a really big uh, differences here. Okay, so continuing my discussion on the solid state batteries, I think. Uh, 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 Professor Andy Sun has shown very nicely that uh, the excitement of solid state batteries. Uh, our group as well, uh, we are actually able to make poach cell solid state batteries and uh, those are always the tricks we show people. Yes, there is no fire, very safe, and we can actually put the solid state battery to operate on the hot plate, 200 degrees Celsius, not a problem. Um, the energy gain for solid state batteries is only enabled if we can actually uh, enable lithium metal cells, uh, li sorry, lithium metal anode. At the same time, if we can actually um, think about the system level integration, because there was many proposals uh, or proposed ideas that uh, because the solid state batteries operates very well at high temperature, it's a possibility to eliminate, eliminate some of the thermal management packaging in the pack level. So I believe in the pack level and the system level, the improvement in the energy density will be more obvious, uh, like what Toyota has shown the, uh, uh, a, a few years ago. I also want to remind everyone that the lithium ion battery are improving dramatically, dramatically, right? In the solid state cell, even though we can improve the energy density, we are not guaranteed that we can drive down the price because at the moment there is no scaling of the solid state batteries. So uh, this is definitely one of the areas that a lot of us are trying uh, our best to optimize. But um, you know, put the commercialization thought aside, uh, from scientific perspective, solid state is a very, very nice platform for scientists to have some fun. Like I mentioned in liquid, you only have an unstable surface when you start to sweep the voltage. So the one here I showed is the liquid cells. In the solid state, the situation is completely different because if you have a uh, sulfide-based electrolyte and a oxide cathode, the interface when you put the two solid materials together, they are chemically unstable. And that's why uh, Dr. Sun showed so much strategies of coating materials, ALD, those interface has to be perfectly protected because otherwise the chemical stability is a problem. Once you can achieve chemical stability, when you sweep the voltage, the reactivity of those electrode materials will change again. So you still have to deal with the SEI problem. And this SEI problem become more complex if you have a mechanical incompatibility between the uh, electrode materials and electrolyte materials. So we wrote this review early this year and uh, according to our uh, counting, you know, if you have cracks or void formed due to mechanical incompatibility, right, because you are moving lithium metal in and out of the materials, uh, you actually create many, many more interfaces compared to what we have in the liquid system. So um, I think uh, the lithium nowbates examples that uh, Dr. Sun already showed 
many group reproduce the data. It's absolutely true if you don't protect the uh, cathode materials against the sulfide electrolyte, the black curve you can see can't even uh, cycle the materials. You can't even activate the materials well. But once with the protective layer, you can do it better. So um, we actually collaborate with my colleague, Professor Xue Bing Ong, who helped us to uh, screen many um, candidates materials for uh, coding. We actually identified the lithium borates as one of the top coating materials that we should apply. And it actually took uh, LG chemistry and us uh, quite some time to finally realize the uh, lithium borates coating. Uh, boron is actually a very interesting element. Uh, it's completely um, it's completely absent in XPS and other typical surface characterization tools. So uh, boron actually is only detected in the uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy. So here you can use EOS. You can very nicely detect the boron before and after the coding. And I also want to emphasize boron chemistry is actually very, very complex uh, because of the bonding nature of the boron. So if you don't quote it correctly, you can actually get elemental boron instead of the boron bonding with the uh, oxygen. So uh, the different uh, uh, coating strategies, you will obtain different chemical environment of the boron. So only one of the synthesis conditions give you very nice uh, stable coating. But you know, overall, I think uh, this work is reported already. So we're very happy to report that uh, uh, lithium boron coating uh, is a very, very promising coating materials that can be applied uh, in the solid state batteries. Uh, so now I would say uh, the other very important uh, uh, parameter for solid state and could be one of the showstoppers for solid state batteries to be commercialized, definitely worth a discussion here. Because um, in the solid state battery synthesis, since everything is solid, you have to actually apply really big pressure. I mean, 25 megapascal is only what we do in the lab. I have seen uh, industry numbers like 75 megapascal, right? So these are pretty big numbers uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, pressure uh, synthesis. Uh, in the early days, um, you know, we really emphasize high pressure because you need to establish a very good solid solid contact so pressure was high so that you can reduce the cell impedance. And because of this reason, uh, many people couldn't cycle lithium metal. You can actually see the dendrite going through the solid state electrolyte. The dendrite will propagate through if you cycle around the 25 to 75 megapascal. Uh, it's not only my student, uh, uh, my postdoc, uh, John Marie, uh, who spent the time to really think about uh, the effect of pressure on the lithium metal, since lithium metal is viscoplastic. Uh, actually, the pressure needs to be lowered in order for us to enable room temperature cycling lithium metal. And uh, like Professor Sun showed, uh, our critical current density is also very low, only 0 0.1 milliamp uh, per centimeter square. So we're, there's still a long way to go for us to really optimize the uh, solid state cells, but I think the good progress has been made. And now we have a better understanding since the anode side, the lithium is very soft, cathode side, the oxide is very hard. So how we can mechanically make them compatible each with each other, the pressure is a very important knob that the scientists should think about how to optimize. Uh, so from the characterization perspective, I think there's a lot of challenges for us. You know, for instance, now we know in solid state SEI is important, but you cannot evaporate the liquid electrolyte. So how can you study the interface uh, chemistry, right? And uh, we also know from my lithium lipon studies, it's very important to get interfacial information at nano scale. How do you uh, thin down this? Um, uh, very bulky solid state batteries to nanoscale observation. That's uh, not an easy job. Last but not least, I think if we want to truly talk about the commercialization of solid state batteries, the bulk cell characterization is so important. This is uh, one of the preliminary data we have obtained. You can see how beautiful large area, a few hundred micrometer thick 
solid or solid state device and how can you characterize it this is not done by uh, traditional fiber it's actually done by plasma fiber and you can see that uh, uh, in this particular cell you know the beautiful architectures of anode uh, separator made by solid state electrolyte and cathode and everything must be perfectly aligned and put together so i would say uh, the uh, characterization challenges for the solid state uh, systems are pretty big uh, last but not least i want to share uh, you know uh, like uh, uh, andy has mentioned you know there's many many solid state electrolytes and i think a recent movement is towards the halides and uh, it's true that uh, uh, lithium based halide system is discovered and I also want to say that uh, at UC San Diego, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Zhen Chen, and I have been working very hard to think about uh, the uh, recyclability, sustainability issues of the solid state batteries. So um, ionic conductivity, interfacial stability, mechanical stability, sustainability, they are all very important. And I think many people are also working on the scalability and the processability of the solid electrolyte. Uh, so instead of uh, um, like, you know, the lithium solid state batteries is very crowded. So instead of doing a lot of our work in the lithium space, we were very lucky to receive the funding support from Shell Corporation to study uh, sodium based uh, solid state batteries because uh, Shell is interested in the large scale uh, energy storage solutions. So, um, you know, we actually were able to uh, collaborate with Professor Shipping Own and really figure out, you know, halides should work very well in sodium cell as well. So this work uh, has already been archived and uh, uh, we report due to the chlorine motions in these um, uh, sodium yttrium zirconia, you can actually make sodium yttrium zirconia chloride systems an analog to the lithium uh, chloride systems and getting close to 10 to minus four, so 0.1 millisiemens, still not as good as the lithium system, but this is the very first um, uh, attempt, I would say first uh, uh, a successful demonstration that we can actually make complete solid solutions uh, in this uh, halide phase. And uh, very excitingly, we report a uh, thousand cycle performances uh, at 40 degrees Celsius right now. Uh, using sodium tin as the anode and uh, this uh, uh, gradient um, solid state uh, electrolyte uh, uh, platform to uh, showcase that it is possible to enable uh, sodium solid state batteries. I think with that, uh, I would like to thank um, my uh, brilliant students and the postdocs and thank my collaborators and I think uh, uh, Dr. Darren Tan or Dr. To be Darren Tan uh, we'll be, uh, uh, you know, taking up a lot of those uh, work done in the lab to uh, commercialization. And uh, we are very fortunate to have the funding support from both industry and also a lot of the tools I developed are U.S. Department of Energy Basic Energy Sciences support. Uh, it's very good to utilize them in the applied program like Battery 500. And with that, thank you very much for your attention.